then looking at the Pakistan constitution and within Pakistan as well as throughout the world. So this was the general uh, spread of my uh, discussion with all of you. I must start with what the Holy Quran exhausts us to do, to be judged, to, to do justice in all affairs. The Quran says, O oh, you who believe, stand up as witnesses for God in all fairness and do not let the hatred of a people deviate you from justice. Very important. Do not let the hatred of a people deviate you from justice. Be just. This is closest to piety and beware of God. Surely God is aware of all what you do. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, Beware, I myself shall invoke the justice of the Almighty on the day of judgment against the person who oppresses and persecutes a mawahid or reduces his rights or burdens him with responsibilities he cannot bear or takes something from him against his will. Starting from there, I endeavored about 10, 15 years ago to do some research on uh, the document which exists is at the, in the St. Catherine Monastery in, Mount, in Sinai. And that document, I called it as a charter of Christian-Muslim harmony. And I looked at the translation, and that document rests in uh, St. Catherine's Church, which was established at uh, a place where uh, it is believed that uh, God communicated with Moses at the burning bush, and the church was established close to that place. That document states, and that's, that is a document which has the stamp of the, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and a similar document is there with, uh, with the stamp of Hazrat Umar, who was the second caliph of the, uh, of the Islamic tradition. That document states that it is a covenant between Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his people till eternity with the Christians. And that covenant states that uh, uh, it, is, it is a compulsion for us that we will ensure that the churches remain sacred, that the hierarchy of the church is not disturbed, that it is up to the Muslims and a covenant between the Prophet and his Ummah till eternity, that it is up to the Muslims to safeguard the church and the rights of the people. Going beyond that, Hazrat Umar, uh, Umar's document was similar a few years later. And then throughout Islamic history, the golden era of Islamic history, the rights of the minorities were preserved. But then coming to India, let me take it a little further back. Usually I, we start at what qaid e azam Muhammad Ali Jinnah said. I would like to take it back almost um, about 70 or 80 years. In 18, 1857, what the Britishers called was the mutiny. And in our history is the first struggle for independence of India against foreign occupation. Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan wrote a pamphlet. In, this happened in 1857. Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan wrote a pamphlet in 1858. Very important. The 500 copies, Peer Saab, of that pamphlet were published. 498 of them very calculatedly, was sent to opinion makers and the legislators to England. Two copies were kept behind. One was given to the government of India in India, and one was kept by Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan himself. And he defined the reason for 1857, and he said, when the rulers do not take care of their people, it is natural that the people revolt against them. So Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan then uh, 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 urged the Muslims to study modern sciences, stay away for a period. He thought that the, the, it is necessary for the Muslims to catch up for, in languages, learn English, learning, learn sciences. For 15 or 20 years, Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan exhorted the Muslims to stay away from politics. But realizing the fact that it is quite possible that the rights of the minorities, now the Muslims in India, which were 20% at that time, the rights will, not, will be encroached upon. So in 18, 
87, he spoke in Lucknow. And in 1888, he spoke in Meerut. And then in 1893, he established a Mohammedan Defense Association to ensure the fact that the minorities, with the, which were the Muslims, their, their rights should be preserved in India. And then let me take you further to 1906 and 7. In 1906, Nawab Salimullah Bahadur, Nawab of Dhaka, uh, the descendant of whom, uh, the grandson of whom became the Prime Minister of Pakistan, Khwaja Nazimuddin. So Nawab of Dhaka organized a conference in Dhaka of Muslims from all over India, and they deliberated for two days. And in the morning of 30th December 2000, 1906, at 9 a.m., they presented a resolution. And the resolution states that the Muslims of India, first the resolution said that we, should we will establish an all India Muslim League. And just before that, there was an Urdu defense uh, commission which was established in 1901 or two. So it culminated into an all India Muslim League. And the resolution stated that we will establish the all India Muslim League, but this, the C part of that resolution, part C stated, that we must ensure among the Muslims that there should be no animosity with any other community. Now keep in mind, the Muslims were struggling against a majority, majoritarian exploitation based on religion. So therefore, the Muslims in 1906 established as resolution number 1C, they ensured the fact that there's, there's, the Muslims, it is up to the Muslims and up to the leadership of the Muslims like all of you today to ensure the fact that there is no animosity with the, any other community. And the most common word I read in those speeches of those days is that in our neighbors, they mentioned less the fact that the Hindus and the Christians, they said we should be at peace with our neighbors, and then they described it occasionally as the Muslim, Hindus and Christians. So that is the evolution of Pakistan starting in 1906 and 1907. And keep, keep in mind, ladies and gentlemen, when we talk of qaid e azam Muhammad Ali Jinnah, Muhammad Ali Jinnah Sahab was totally opposed to the formation of a separate state in 1906. He believed that the Muslims and Hindus could exist together and preserve each other's rights. And Sir Sultan Muhammad Agha Khan Sahab, who was present in 1906 and 1907 as the third, uh, Sultan Muhammad Shah Agha Khan III, he says that there's one gentleman who became, who is a lawyer, brilliant lawyer from Bombay, who is totally opposed to the establishment of a separate state because he believes that the min minorities and majorities as far as constitutional rights and implementation of constitutional rights is concerned, they, will, they can live together, they can stay together. And by, 19, uh, by 1928 and 29, after Allahabad address of Allama Iqbal, that is pr approximately the time when qaid e azam after having struggled for 20 years, trying to keep harmony between the Muslims and the Hindus, the, which was the majority uh, at that time, trying to ensure the fact that there should be some compromise in a, in a statehood where all rights are preserved. He gave up hope on a united India. And that is when Aga Khan, the Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan talked about a separate homeland of the Muslims in the late 19th century. And uh, and Qaid uh, Azam Muhammad Ajila Jinnah started talking about it in 1930s. This is necessary, it's necessary for us to understand. A community, a Muslim minority in India, when it was struggling to ensure the fact that the rights of the Muslims are preserved, it is important, it is a part of history of Pakistan. Now, when Pakistan is formed, therefore, it is incumbent on us that while we were struggling against a majority, we should ensure the fact that the minorities in Pakistan, their rights must be ensured. And therefore, you see the August 11th speech of Qaid Azam Muhammad Ali Jinnah, when he says that as far as the state is concerned, you can go to worship in the temples or in the mosque, but as far as the state is concerned, all are equal before the law. The same thing then gets enshrined in the constitution of Pakistan. Article 20 states, freedom to profess religion and to manage religious institutions must be ensured. 
Article 20 of the Pakistan Constitution. Article 21, that safeguard against taxation for purposes of any particular religion. Article 25, ladies and gentlemen, says that all citizens, including minorities, are equal before the law and are ent entitled to equal protection of law. Article 27, it safeguards against discrimination in services based on religion. And Article 36 is a protection of minorities. And to ensure the fact that the minorities are in the assemblies, the Constitution of Pakistan has 10 seats for minorities in the assembly and four seats in the Senate. What pa Muslims in India struggle against, the Muslims in Pakistan in their constitution ensured representation. It is quite possible that no area in Pakistan can be a Hindu majority constituency or a Christian majority constituency. So therefore, safeguarding the rights of the, of the minorities, the Pakistan constitution has ensured that they are represented in the assembly. Let me tell you, in all the speeches in All India Muslim League, Nawab Salimullah Bahadur and the first president of All India Muslim League was Nawab Mushtaqul Mulk or Nawab Waqarul Mulk. In all their speeches in 1906 and 1907 are talking about harmony within the communities living in, in a country. Now coming to Pakistan, there are issues like uh, Qadri Saab, you mentioned very well that everything is not hunky-dory, everything is not fine, and therefore everything is not also uh, uh, terrible. They, this is a struggle which is going on to ensure the fact that there should be harmony. And people like you and the leadership sitting here from all faiths are responsible for that. I'm glad that the Pakistan, uh, the government of Pakistan, and primarily Mr. Imran Khan, with his definite faith and commitment towards the minorities, is ensuring a minorities rights commission, is ensuring the fact that there should be, at every level, there should be committees to ensure the fact. Sometimes what happens is that because of narrow-mindedness, an incident of conflict takes a, racial, a, a religious color. It doesn't start normally as a religious color at all. It starts on property, it starts on animosity of such different origin, but then it all of a sudden takes a religious color. So, the, so therefore, it should be ensured that even at the district level or at the union tessie level, there must be uh, a, a, a committee to ensure, to uh, very quickly make sure the, that uh, the, the tempers, if they have been uh, raised, to bring them down. That prompt reaction from your ministry and from uh, all, all your committees and all your deliberations is a very important factor. Having said all this, this is a struggle which will continue. It, will, it, it is a struggle which, con which continues. It is in, within human nature that we talk about the fact that there are differences within the Muslim community as well. There are sometimes based, uh, Pakistan's politics is based on caste, Sometimes bradri is not caste really, not racial in any way, but bradri is, and therefore there is sometimes exploitation and non-representation. I think this struggle uh, continues. Pakistan is changing. Pakistan is coming towards a new era. But at the same time, Pakistan has made tremendous sacrifices. We have learned that we can't divide our own people. We have learned that we can't divide our own people. We have that we और हम में निफाक पैदा हुआ तो पाकिस्तान का भी इंतहा नुकसान हुआ लिहाजा हमने तो सीख लिया मगर इफ यू लुक एट द अदर साइड एट लुक एट आवर ईस्टर्न बॉर्डर्स द सेम द थिंग्स आर हैपनिंग व्हिच विल क्रिएट टेंशन इन इंडिया बिटवीन माइनॉरिटीज एंड द मेजॉरिटी इट इज एक्चुअली हैपनिंग एंड to the extent that laws are being changed. You see, there is sometimes there's just a tension between communities. But when you see that laws are being changed in favor of a majority to isolate a minority, that's a dangerous precedence. And Mr. Imran Khan has talked about it. The government of Pakistan has talked about it. Pakistani politicians have, have talked about the fact that this can lead to uh, genocide. It's as dangerous as that. The isolation, the fact that riots upon riots take place. The fact that if, if a minority, a person in, of minority succeed in, succeeds in uh, tijarat and trade, they are brought down through riots. And 
hardly 2% representation in, in the assemblies in India, hardly 2%, where definitely the Muslim minority, at least also the Christian minority there, is definitely more than 14%, and you get 1 or 2% representation. So India is playing with fire. It's not comfortable for us. Why? Because the, the, the embers from that fire will come towards Pakistan and will create a situation where Pakistan will be blamed for what they are doing themselves. What is happening in Kashmir is based on a prejudice against the Muslims. The laws are being changed. Ladies and gentlemen, the most dangerous factor. What we are doing here, the laws in, of Pakistan exist, like I pointed out. Protections in the Constitution exist. We are refining them. We are trying to improve those laws. But we are not changing the laws in a negative direction. What is happening in India, the laws are going in a negative direction. Very dangerous situation just across the border. At the same time, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, if something happens, like it was mentioned as far as blasphemy is concerned, as far as uh, Namu Sarisalat is concerned, the West is being made to understand after Mr. Imran Khan's speech in the United Nations, the West is being communicated the fact that the Prophet ﷺ is very dear to us and therefore any incident or any situation where in the name of freedom of speech you insult the Prophet, it insults the entire Muslim Ummah. So therefore there has to be care. There has to be. The laws exist in Europe. For example, you cannot deny the Holocaust in many countries. The laws exist in protection certain ideas, protecting certain ideas, the violation of which can create social disharmony. Similarly, the laws should make sure that this does not happen. On the other hand, what we see, particularly in France, and therefore I urge the political leadership of France, very important statement, ladies and gentlemen, I urge the political leadership of France not to entrench these attitudes into laws. It requires social harmony. You have to bring people together, not to stamp a religion in a certain manner, and create disharmony among the people or create bias. So therefore, what happens in the rest of the world can have repercussions among people. We don't want Pakistan's, <coughs> the Prime Minister has promised to ensure the fact, <coughs> excuse me, the government has promised to ensure the fact that there are no reactions as such, but it can't happen. It can't happen that there are legal changes taking place as different from the United Nations Charter, as different from the promises which have been made. And Europe has made tremendous progress towards religious harmony. So let that there not be a retrogressive step. For situations which arise out of animosity, for situations which are carried forward by people who do not know what real Islam is, for that, for that to be picked up, to label the entire religion in a different manner and to start taking precautions under, uh, of the, uh, the, uh, against the entire community, to take precautions against the entire religion, sparks of the fact that not now, but 10 years later, this will have very bad repercussions. So therefore, standing before this forum in a very responsible manner, the government of Pakistan has urged upon, upon the French government to ensure the fact that this doesn't happen. It creates waves. The waves, the immediacy of the damage may not be evident in the next few year, in the next year or two, but definitely it will become evident in the next 10 years. So therefore, rather than bringing the world together, the need of the world today is to come together. There, is, there are issues much beyond this. There is climate change which we have to fight together. There is a, there's a race in the world of hegemony, of uh, 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 of exploitation. We have to fight those things. Of poverty, we have to fight poverty. We have to bring people together. It can't happen. What is done in one part of the world has ref reflections to the rest. For example, the immigrants struggling to go into the European Union. Why is that? Because the economies of the region surrounding them has been devastated because of wars. So the time when today the Humanity cannot rise of its vested interest. Humanity cannot rise up to its own established ideals. Humanity cannot rise up to what the UN Charter has said. If the humanity cannot rise to what Prophet ﷺ mentioned, if humanity cannot rise was Hazrat Isa, Jesus, 
mentioned as peace between people. None of these, none of the exploitation of a community on, on the basis of religion. So therefore, we are retrogressing. We are going behind what has been, what we have been taught, what we have grown with. What are the ideals of the church and the mosque? We don't want to leave those ideals behind. So ladies and gentlemen, just in the end, let me tell you that Pakistan is on a different course. Pakistan, the, the leadership of the present government has laid the foundation of the fact that in Pakistan, we believe today, it's in our interest also, the morality behind our decisions, at the same time, it's in our self-interest that the people of Pakistan must be together. And all laws and everything we do we must ensure that there will be accidents, there will be incidents, and we will fight them very promptly. But we believe in an emerging Pakistan, which is a country of peace and harmony with all religions, with all colors of people, with all minorities and majority, merged into an ideal of progress, peace, and prosperity. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much.